Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Critical Reactions with your host, Brian. We're going to do a special selection today, which is where one of you tell me exactly what it is I need to check out. Today's request comes at us from Hunter. Special selection request, Gatling. Absolute. We have no context on this. We're just going to be diving in headfirst, unknowing of where we are venturing. We're looking at the song Absolute from their Before Math album, which is uh, it's, it's the opposite of Aftermath, right? Let's dive in and see what Gatling is bringing to the table today. Nice four here. Oh. I'll tell you, the chord progression is very comfortable for me. This could go in a lot of directions. Very emo intro, though. The harmonics on the right are a nice touch. The bass right in the middle. the ornamental things just for chords and drums here. I like how the bass is getting in on this. direction to take this.
the layers. The 16th notes on the on the melody guitar, the movement, the bass line, the shifting accents on the chordal guitar. <laughs> the octave shift in the middle of the panic. they ditched the effect, but it's still here. You've got to be coming up on the ending soon. This feels like a conclusion. of uh, three ands. Bringing in elements of the intro back. That's nice. What is this melody? I recognize that, but I can't place what section it came from. Um, perplexed, flabbergasted, uh, I don't know, man. What's going on here? Hi, we're Gatling. We don't play music under this name anymore, but don't let that dissuade from listening to our material. Huh. So I wonder what happened to him. Here's the thing, right? I like this song. I do. It it has it has some rough edges. Uh, the vocals are rather pitchy in a lot of places. The production is a bit raw, and I would like uh, a little bit more clarity in some places, a little bit better balancing in others. But generally, what is on paper here is rather well done. Uh, something that I actually like, which is pretty rare for the channel. <laughs> I listen to a lot of music I would not listen to on my own. That's for sure. Uh, <laughs> Um, not throwing shade. I, I enjoy it. It's good to expand one's, uh, one's horizons. And y'all definitely do that with me. But, uh, yeah, we don't listen to too much stuff that I'm like, I need to listen to more of this. This is right up my alley. And I kind of think that this is. And I think it's primarily just because we don't listen to a lot of emo or post-hardcore on the channel, which is what I would call my home genres. And it's nice to get something in that area. But this song... Even outside of the rough production of it, goes in some really interesting directions that I'm not too sure how to interpret. It isn't complete. Well, okay, let's let's start from a different perspective. What do what do I mean when I say this? This is emo music. To me, especially when we look at stuff closer to cap and jazz. And that uh, like origin of post-hardcore, where it was really combining some of the later elements of emo with uh, some punkier ideas. There was, um, I wouldn't necessarily call it, a, call it a standardization of chord progression, but there was definitely a chordal mode 
that the music had found worked really well for it. And to me, it defines a lot of more ballady, post-hardcore stuff, stuff on the lighter side, and a lot of what emo went through before uh, and around Midwest emo, which has its own harmonic flavoring to it. Um, but there's this very specific flavor here that tends to be a bit more of a wistful sorrow that uh, immediately reminds me of so much music I listened to as a teen, and that's how the song kicks off. And it's what defines the melodic pattern for not just the instruments, but also the vocals, which we're going to touch on that in a second. The vocals very rarely deviate from their chordal mode. <laughs> it, it, it's an interesting idea. But the beginning of the song has the right instrumental tone, it has the right rawness of production, it has the right melodic flow and note choices on top of said uh, harmony and chord progression that, uh, and of course it's all very downbeat and sad, it's very emotional. So it captures a lot of what I think is very stereotypical emo music on pretty much every element of the composition. It then expands upon this, which I really liked. Rhythms get passed around between instruments, different types of flourish or, or ornamentation are introduced. We have harmony on the vocals, two different types of harmony. In fact, one was harmony of an octave lower. We also had harmony of a third above. We had a variety of, of different combinations of dyads from the vocals that I, I greatly enjoyed. Uh, the melodies themselves all felt very comfortable to me. Um, and like I said, this feels like stereotypical emo music. Right up my alley. But then we had a shift. And this is where I was going a little bit ago before I wanted to define what was going on. We shifted into some rather heavy, aggressive music. We brought in some riffs rather than ornamentation or chords. Uh, these guitar riffs utilize, used a lot of uh, pedal tone in order to create uh, space and sound and texture underneath the core melody, which is what sits on the top of it. Uh, we brought harmony on top of this. We brought heavier drum work. I don't know what kind of... I mean, post-hardcore, I think, would probably be where this fits. Um... But what I found really interesting is that the vocals didn't really change. I don't necessarily think I expected screaming. But I did expect the vocal note choices to shift along with the guitar choices. Uh, we, we, we changed from a very emotive, sorrowful chord progression to something a bit angstier and rule of cool and that means we shifted from something that was a bit more expressive in the harmony to something that was a bit um, constrained um, and focused on a specific texture that wasn't sadness it was edgy the vocals though continue to use the notes that they had in the original section and it felt a bit out of place here. It ends up working I think ultimately and I'm going to chalk that up to my familiarity with both of these sounds but I think if I was an, uh, a bit more of an outsider to the genres this would feel like an odd mashup to me. On paper this doesn't really feel like it should work. So I think that's a really interesting decision there, and I wonder if that's one bred out of uh, necessity or intuition. That is to say, did they necessarily do this because they wanted to, or is this just the key that the vocalist is most at home in, and so they just kept singing in that key? Uh, it, it creates an interesting sound. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. From here, though, we return back to something a bit closer to that slower, more atmospheric emo stuff, and I figured this was going to be the two modes that the song exists in. It's really not out of um, 
out of the ordinary for emo and post-hardcore to have this bit of crossover where the lighter sounds can feel more emo and the heavier sounds can feel more post-hardcore. Um, at least as far as I'm concerned, the two have a lot of common ground in the Venn diagram of the two, and it's probably why I found my way through both of them as a teen. Um, but they don't, they don't go that route. And this is wild, too, because the song begins to enter into a linearity. We never really return back to anything, which is cool. I dig that. But we continue to explore these lighter, sorrowful, emotive sections. And I, I think that's cool. It's just totally unexpected. And I think that's where this song continues to get me. It doesn't do what I expect it to do ever honestly and and I like that but I don't quite think it ever comes together I I wish that the directions that they chose to take some of these ideas were I don't know a, a different direction a different choice to re retain the linearity of concept with a different execution if that makes sense uh, that is to say, I never really felt like any of these sections felt connected in any way other than saying, oh, you know, they all exist in the song, so that justifies them being played back to back. But nothing ever felt like it was, it was all part of the same idea. It feels like five completely disparate concepts that they just smashed together to form a seven minute song. And I don't really get any overarching narrative out of that, other than the smashing together of things, which of course can be conceptually or artistically sound, and maybe when we get to the lyrics, it makes sense for this to be a smorgasbord of ideas. But I found myself more confused on my first playthrough of this than, than understanding. Nothing really quite clicked with me, and it felt a bit more of the experimenting for experimental sake, more so than experimenting because they have something they need to say that they can't do with more traditional means. And, uh, you know, one's not better than the other. I have my preference. I tend to like thematic reasoning for experimentation, uh, but I, I generally enjoyed each of the individual moments of this song, even if it never really came together as a whole for me. But there was one neat twist that I have to bring up about this. That final section had a little bit of everything. I don't know that it was justified. I don't know if it earned the right to bring back so many motifs when the song feels so disconnected. Although maybe that is also the point itself, to find a way to weave the thread through so many different ideas in order to create a larger quilt. Metaphorically, of course, <laughs> music is not a quilt. Um, and maybe that works too. Uh, that was definitely something that would take multiple listens, though, to fully grasp that concept. And that's usually the issue with this format of, hey, Brian, listen to it once and try to explain it. Some songs I can do that on. Some others mm, need more than one go worth of information. Um, and that might be what happens on this track. But I do like all of the callbacks that happen in that final section. I thought that was cool. I'm a huge fan and supporter of incorporating motif and callbacks into music. I talk about this all the time. I love when old ideas get brought back. And they did a fantastic job with that. We had the riff from the beginning of the song, the 16th note idea that was on the acoustic guitar, or at least a clean electric maybe, on a distorted guitar here. We had a rhythm present, um, and maybe even a melody too, that we had heard elsewhere. I couldn't place exactly where it was, but it felt familiar enough. I, I love all of this. It's just so cool. It's not even just a callback in a recontextualization of a single idea either. It's multiple ideas. It's building a new section from building blocks of old ones. Fantastic. Absolutely love that. And I think it's one of the things that elevated this song for me. There is a there's another universe where this song doesn't do that. And I walk away from it a bit disappointed hearing a lot of potential, but ultimately not enjoying the song as much as I could have. But in this version, I think this ending sort of 
it tries to heal up some of the wounds of the song and, and uh, some of the things I didn't like. It allows me to forget about them because the ending comes off so strong to me. Just a quick bit of praise here. I love the bass work on this track. You all know I love it when I can hear a bass. I love it when I can hear a bass do cool things. We get both of them in here. Uh, the bassist has some walking lines. They punctuate ideas. They do call and response. Um, and it's just a nice meaty tone that is very interesting given the rough production on the song. The bass is usually the last thing to get good production. So if the song as a whole isn't great, the bass is usually just as forgotten. But here, the production's a little rough, and the bass ends up sounding pretty good. So, I'll take that. The other are the vocal harmonies. I already brought this up once, but I want to bring it up again because I feel like it's one of the stronger parts of the song. Um, every time they came in, I was left wanting more. Again, there's some intonation things going on here, but ultimately it was never enough of a distraction uh, to pull me out of the song. Always just a little flat, a little sharp, and sometimes the harmonies ended up feeling a bit dissonant, but again, not often enough to really bring my attention to it in too negative of a way. But I would love to hear if the band's still playing. Since we don't play this music, we don't play music under this name anymore, if they're still playing music, if they have improved since uh, possibly 2012, at least that's when this was uploaded to, I don't know, like YouTube, sometimes the upload date gets messed up. Um, and it, instead of saying the release date, it'll be upload date. But Bandcamp's pretty good about that, right? So when this says released April 2012, that's when the album came out, right? Anyways, in the past decade or so, if they have been playing and improved their craft, I would love to hear them take another shot at this and make a remastered version. And not even necessarily change it compositionally, just with the skills that they have, uh, bringing, making the vocals just a little bit tighter, uh, softening up the production, bringing some things in line, balancing everything a little bit better. I'd, I'd love to hear them take another crack at this and and make a a, a version of it in line with their uh, their skills today. Their other band is called Killed No Albatross. I want to see if they were still going, but uh, their last release was an EP in 2018, which really doesn't feel like that long ago, but six years. It's been six years since 2018, um, and that's a long time for a band to take a hiatus, so they might be out of the game at this point. I think I'm going to have to check out both of these bands, though, because I did enjoy absolute let me dive into some lyrics here and then we're going to wrap this up all right a couple of interesting things first of all is that the band that created that latest ep for kill no albatross is not the same band that made this album of before math the only member who is the same between them is the guitarist and backing vocalist so that's a bit of a, a shame. Also, not on this song particularly, but there are two songs on this album where the drummer played third guitar. How often do you hear about the drummer playing guitar? That's awesome. I love that. Also, everybody does vocals on this except the drummer. So I'm always a big fan of having a lead vocalist and multiple backing vocalists. I'm definitely going to have to check this album out because there's a lot that's that's absolutely working for me uh, as far as just context to it, but, you know, the song itself. Unfortunately, there is a paragraph here that says they rarely play these songs live anymore, even as their new band, that it is a, a time capsule of who they were. They're not, they don't disown the album, they don't hate it, but it's not... You know, it's not them anymore. As they said, we made this in high school. So <laughs> it took a long time to make this. They're proud of it. It's just, you know, it's not who they are anymore. So they don't play these songs live. And I think that's a that's a big stance to take. I don't know how big of a band they are now. But I can't imagine a big rock star, big pop star, whatever. You know, 
who Seether goes on stage. I can't imagine a scenario where they don't play Mouth of Madness, you know, their biggest hit from the last decade. They're stuck playing that song forever. POD will never be able to go on stage and not play Youth of the Nation or something. There, It's just too big of a song. It's grown beyond the band themselves. Um, and for, you know, an artist to say, this is who we were, we don't do this stuff live anymore, I think that's that's... I think that's a big move. It's a bold move, but I think it's something I'd like to see more artists do. I mean, I, I'm not a huge fan of, of Brendan Urie, but, you know, he's been pretty vocal about how he doesn't like I Write Sins, Not Tragedies. He doesn't like playing it. He's been, even during shows, <laughs> when the song's about to come on, he'll badmouth it a little bit. The dude's tired of playing that song. They should just stop. Uh, I mean, there a little bit of a, a little bit of it is performance, right? You want to give the audience what they want, but I mean, you also have to love what you're doing too. And if that song doesn't represent you, or or you don't want to be associated with it, or if it's not, it's not something you enjoy doing, you should be able to step away from it. Anyways, lyrics. <laughs> Uh, cause I got way off topic there. I'm not entirely sure what this is about. It's, it's a bit vague. The opening stanza, I think cements a thesis statement though. It says my hands, they try to mend the mistakes that you have made, but it's already too late. And your hands, they try to feel as they take away, as they steal. So I'm trying to fix things and you're just trying to make things worse. The second stanza says goodbye, my friends in absolute this almost feels like that this person's trust has been completely obliterated, not just for this one person, but for everyone. It's not just goodbye my friends, it's goodbye my friends in absolute. And I think this can be read two ways. It's either an absolute goodbye or a goodbye to absolutely all of his friends. I think either way it shows this diminished trust in people. But there is a spectacle to it as well. You can't just walk away from a friend group, especially in high school. He says, I drown in my own blood. The crowd stares at me as I walk. Um, you now word kind of gets round. This group of people hung out for three years of high school. It's now senior year and he's not, he's not hanging out anymore. It's the rumor mill starts going. It's, uh, you know, it becomes a spectacle. Um... He says that he now has thoughts swimming inside his head. He feels like he's locked in a room awaiting his, dis his demise with nowhere to go but anywhere from here, which isn't worded great. <laughs> the idea of being locked in a room and saying that there's nowhere to go, I think, lines up. But then the subversion of this says that he can go anywhere away from here. There's nowhere to go except anywhere from here. I mean, could have just said, I can't stay here anymore. I think that would have made a lot more sense and been a bit more grammatically correct. Regardless, the idea is that he's putting all of this behind him. The final two words of this song is just a reiteration of the beginning. He says, my hands, almost as if to say that he has some, uh, um, some impact, some catalyst to all of this. Uh, some responsibility in in this fallout. And you know, the somber mood of most of this I think fits well, but also we have the more aggressive angry sections, which I don't th think is expressed as clearly in the lyrics, but I mean, you have friends backstabbing you and, and trying to steal stuff from, from you while you're trying to heal relationships. Yeah, you're going to be a bit ticked off about that. <laughs> There's going to be some animosity there. I was trying to, to build the bridge and, and fix it, and, and you were over there <laughs> cutting the ropes down again. <laughs> the ones I just tied back together. Yeah, there's going to be some, some frustration with that. So I think the song does a good job of capturing all this, but emo is... I mean, it's, it's a genre that does that very well. I tend to expect that. And now that I say that, I wonder if that's why I have such expectations for lyrics and music to line up because uh you know my favorite genre of classical is still 
um, romantic, which is very much about uh, trying to encapsulate a a concept into music. You're you're trying to tie a, a theme, uh, a, a mental theme into a sonic one. It, it's about synergy of theme. And when I got into rock, after you know getting into mainstream radio stuff, when when I ventured outside of that, I went into emo, which was yes, it's right there in the name. <laughs> it's about thematic resonance. So a lot of the music I've I've grown up on is um, sort of about that. Anyways, enough about me. Those are my thoughts on Gatling. Gatling. That is how I would say it. Gatling. Wait, is it two or three syllables? When I say Gatling, it makes me feel very southern. But when I say Gatling, that sounds wrong entirely. Y'all let me know about that. Anyways, the song Absolute from the Before Math album. I love that. The opposite of the aftermath must be the before math. I mean, that's just that's just grammar right there. <laughs> what did you think of this song? Did you enjoy it? Did anything stand out to you? Is there anything you'd like to add on to what I said or correct me on? Just give me your own perspective on things. Put all that stuff down in the comment section. Above that, in the description box, you'll find a link to Linktree. It takes you here. You can find links to my music, ways to support the channel, a link to the Discord server, so much more. Above that, if you could, like, subscribe, and ring the bell. I greatly appreciate all three of those. All right, that wraps it up for this one. We do have some brand new music um, coming up tomorrow. We have uh, the end of this week's theme coming up tomorrow. All that's 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 9 p.m. UTC as usual. Until next time, remember to be critical, not cynical, of the music you listen to and have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening whenever you choose to watch my videos. Mm -hmm.